Now, how did I get onto all that? <laughs> oh, so, so by 1905, you see, Einstein had written two papers, his relativity paper, from which he knew that things going away have their, their mass uh, redshifted away. Never mind redshifted. Forget redshifted. Something going away from you is seen by you as being less massive. Something coming toward you is seen to be more massive, and he knew exactly how much. He also knew from his quantum mechanics paper in 1905, from the, on the photoelectric effect, that when things are going away, the radiation is redshifted, and when they're coming toward you, it's blue shifted. And he knew that the energy of the photons was related to the frequency. And he knew exactly how much they lose going away and how much they gain coming in. And he simply put those two things together. That if the radiation goes, goes if, the, if the energy of the radiation goes down and the energy of the object goes down, it must be that the radiation and the, and the energy are the same thing. Or the energy and the mass. Let me, I'm sorry, I used the wrong words. The, the, the energy of the, of the radiation goes down the, and the mass of the object goes down. It's a very simple thing to notice that they're the same thing because he has numbers on both of them. So in 1905, Einstein came out with two famous equations. First is that, that the geometry goes from 3D to 4D and space and time come in as a pair of opposites. We see things away from us in space by the trick of seeing them backwards in time, the same as we do when we're asleep. And the other equation was that which we see as, as, as matter is just potential energy. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so are you saying then that between the emission event and the absorption event, I can bring it back to astronomy, if we're looking at M31, there is no duration? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say there's no time, and I didn't say there's no space. I said the total separation, the space-time separation is what goes to zero. Not the space separation, not the time separation. If you drive backwards out of your driveway for five miles and then come back in, you'll still be in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you not indicating a paradox by saying that the particle or the object going away at the edge of the universe is getting less massive? What about the observer that would be at that particular point looking back at us? Would we not be getting less massive? Everybody sees his own dream from his own position. And everybody sees this universe from his own position, which is always at the center. Mm -hmm. Ptolemy never had it so good. <laughs> All the observers are at the center. <laughs> <coughs> Now, you see, even the Big Bang model has to have the particles recycling from the border. Even the Big Bang people can't get out of it. It has to do that. The only way you could get out of it is to put Heisenberg in the, un in the, in the uh, subjunctive. If I were at the border, you can't be at the border. So that's one thing I don't under that's another thing I don't understand about the Big Bang. This stuff has to recycle from the border. What if the universe is radiating out like the sun radiates uh, light and energy? I just told you that the sun doesn't radiate light. <laughs> well, you said there's a solar wind and it's losing mass and it's losing energy. All right, yes. The particles are leaving. They're leaving. The particles leave at speeds They're lower leaving. than the speed of light, right. They're leaving the sun. That's I'll right. They'll never see the sun again in, in a relatively short period of time, right? What if the same, what if our universe is acting the same way? In what way? It's particles, it's mass, it's leaving. But the trouble is they can't get beyond the border. Why can't they get beyond the border? Do I have to go through this again? <laughs> <laughs> because out by the border. back, gravity? No. Listen up this time. <laughs> when they approach the border, as seen by us. Uh, as seen by us is not good. Then stuff it. <laughs> if the universe were actual, it would not be as seen by us. But if the universe is not actual and it cannot be actual, then it's as seen by us. You obviously don't believe in a big crunch at the end either, then, Joe. No, I don't. Okay. And I don't believe there's an end either. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> That's a way for the matter to get back from the edge, though, isn't it? No, no. No? It's a continuous thing. A continuous thing. The density stays where it is. Okay. Steady state. <laughs> yeah, very steady. Yeah. It doesn't back come down. What? It doesn't back come down to if man had not evolved, would there be a universe? <laughs> Well, that's a problem that the, st that the uh, quantum machinists have. They have to have a sentiency because always the observer is, gets mixed up in what he sees. But it doesn't have to be physicists, you see. <laughs> I had a quarrel with some physicists in Michigan many years ago, and I said, yes, I know. You're very sophisticated beings. You know where down is. But if you really want to know where down is, you hang an insentient piece of lead on an insentient piece of string. And nobody opened his peeper. You see, matter is sentiency. All these things know where the earth is. If I drop my keys, I don't have them in my pocket. What do I have in my pocket? I have my salt bottle. If I drop this, you see, it knows exactly where the earth is. It knows exactly. No use telling me it doesn't know. Matter itself is sentient. If you didn't have a gravitational field, you would not notice the gravitational field of the Earth. Gravitational fields are the only things that read gravitational fields. Electrical fields are the only things that read electrical fields. I've always wanted two pictures of myself. We have a great big scale here, and I stand on it. It reads 140 pounds. Then we turn it over, and I stand on it again, and it reads 140 pounds. And we'll show them both with the scales right side up. In one case, it's my weight and the gravitational field of the Earth. In the other case, it's the Earth and the gravitational field of me. <laughs> if you didn't have a gravitational field, you wouldn't notice any anywhere else. Yes. No, you're over there and I'm over here. <laughs> However, you see, <coughs> I have always thought, well, first I'm going to quote something. There's a, an old Indian scripture in Sanskrit, it says, when a man is asked who is there, he first says I. And then he gives some other name which he may have. <laughs> we all have that nice name, I. And the question is whether there are two of it. It has not been shown in hard evidence in our physics that there are two of us. We have lots of soft evidence for the plurality of the observer, and we have no hard evidence. When you dream, in the dream you have a dream body, and you see many other dream bodies. When you wake up, you understand you were all of it. <coughs> the physics says that it's that way now. The physicists don't say so. The equations say so. One thing I learned at the university was read equations. <laughs> that I learned. You know, in the physics department, when you have a midterm, if you write a word, you get a zero. What they want is an equation, not a word. I must be dismissed. three words. Change less, infinite, and undivided. Now, if it's undivided, there's only one of us. Whatever the hell it may look like. Was your world view or universe view formed in the monastery and solidified by the physics or formed by the physics and solidified by the I was a physicist first and monastic afterwards, but I haven't, I can't, I still have my corpus callosum closed. I haven't got one world with five elements on Sunday and 92 elements on Monday.